Why go through this? Work the way I do, at this pace and level of control. Why do it? Why? If the concern is profit, wealth, a level of comfort, there are more reasonable ways. I'm not saying to avoid the pursuit. If you can't find any other way to walk this plane of existence without endeavoring to beat down the door of the unattainable, I understand. It's not to say that there's any lack of wealth in this pastime, this obsession, driving force, this way of life. I would say it's incredibly packed with wealth, as long as you consider working with these materials, demanding specifications, and a constant drive to improve, to perfect something that you may never perfect as well. It's an incredibly fulfilling life, loaded with hard-earned successes and failures, the latter being more important. Interesting enough that I think it's worth the effort to explain it to you, and I hope you agree. I've thickness sanded this stock and created a joined edge along one side, making the stock parallel and square on three surfaces. I go to these lengths with good purpose. I want a dimensionally accurate part. And while there are ways of achieving that without so much work, this, along with a couple of other tricks, is the best way I've found. In the last video, we discussed using multiple work offsets to produce one-sided parts in a series of operations, eliminating unnecessary tool changes. In this week's video, I hope to show another element of production milling that I use to create multiple custom parts simultaneously. Let's bring up Fusion 360 and see how to implement this idea. Like last time, I will create a new file and import the designs. Fusion makes this easy by right-clicking the project and selecting Insert into the current design. The first obvious point is that one of these necks uses a scarf joint headstock. The second is in the typical fender style. When we remove the extra material from the back of the headstock, we have to support the headstock angle I like to build up a temporary support with MDF and hot glue and use a scallop toolpath to mill the face of the support. I make a quick sketch and extrude the shape to generate the scarf joint and cam. I also use this toolpath to cut the scarf joint, keeping the angle in a tight tolerance that's relied on in later operations. I get a lot of flack over this technique, and I'm not sure that folks understand how necessary these details are. It does take a bit of time, and yes, it is worth it. So let's create that scallop toolpath, and then we can go ahead and mark out the scarf joint on the stock, rough cut it on the bandsaw, and mill the angle on the CNC. I created a new setup and set it to the size of the solid body derived from the scarf angle. I set the origin in a spot that's relatively easy to indicate. After cleaning up the joint by hand, I can glue it up and get back to the cam. I glue the scarf joint with a small overhang, milled off before cutting the headstock profile. This is a practice that I follow as often as possible. I don't like to rely on the accuracy of a glue joint, no matter how well planned, braced, or indexed. I attach the pieces and mill through the joint, making the face I'm working with as accurate and square as possible. In this case, I use a Mach 3 wizard to create the facing toolpath, simplifying my workflow.
I also use a Mach 3 wizard to cut the sacrificial material I use to align parts to the machine's x-axis. I can then cut the tuner holes and headstock shape. In Fusion 360, I create a new setup, and along with it, an origin and orientation that I will continue to use with the other setups. This is an important point, pardon the pun. When you indicate from different points in successive setups and orientations, you rely on the stock dimensions for accuracy. I like to continue to indicate from the same indexing point regardless of the change in orientation. I need to reset the stock so the headstock angle can overhang the bed to cut the truss rod slot. I create another setup, an origin, and orientation from the same point as the previous operation, but oriented differently on the machine. Whenever possible, it's a good idea to duplicate machining operations to eliminate confusion. I create a pocket operation for the truss rod slot, duplicate it, and make the necessary changes for the selected geometries for the secondary pocket for the truss rod. The next two operations will happen from the other side of the stock, and for that, we will duplicate the setup again, adjust the origin, and develop the tool paths to complete the neck milling. The process on the second neck is almost identical, except the support material for the headstock is much simpler. I set the work offsets for the operations on the first neck to 1. This correlates to G54. On the second neck, the operations are set to offset 2, generated as G55 work offsets. There's an additional setup for the scarf neck headstock, so I set that up as its own file. The second file will have the truss rod slots for both necks. Then I have to do the work of flipping over and re-indexing the origin points for both necks as G54 and G55. I'll run the half-inch tool pocket operations for both necks together, then the contour, and finally the scallop operations, saving myself at least four tool changes. There are many sanity checks along the way, and it's always a good idea to double or triple check your tool paths through simulation to ensure that there are no errors.
And that's all there is to it. Easy peasy. Well, maybe not. I'm sure some of that didn't translate well, and if it didn't, feel free to let me know in the comments. As always, I very much appreciate the time you've given me and the support you've provided through Patreon membership. If this stuff interests you, consider joining the Patreon group for $1 a month. I provide many of the Fusion 360 files you see here on the channel, and it's a great way to further your knowledge by looking through my setups, CAD, and CAM, and using it as a jumping off point for your own techniques. Thanks for watching.